So friends, we turn this morning to John's Gospel and we're going to be jumping through a couple of the verses uh, through the story of Jesus last evening. Uh, jumping from John chapter 13 to chapter 14 into chapter 16. Let me begin by reading simply verse 1 from chapter 13. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then we jump to chapter 14, reading from verse 1 to verse 7, as Jesus speaks to his disciples wanting to comfort them. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And then we jump ahead to chapter 16 and verses 5 to 7. And Jesus continues speaking to his disciples. He says, But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, Where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Just reading so far this morning. Friends, what a night it has been for Jesus. A night that begins with a party, a celebration with his friends. And yet a celebration which ends with betrayal, arrest and a trial. And what a night it has been for his followers Perhaps beginning with an expectation of triumph, an expectation that as, that as we celebrate the Passover, we're going to leave from this place and we're going to go into, into Jerusalem, we're going to take the capital by force. And yet instead of the triumph that they've been expecting the whole week, we discover that the evening ends for them in desolation. A night in which at every moment they were expecting Jesus to reveal his glory ends in tragedy. And I wonder as the events of the evening unfolded, I wonder if they kept on hoping for something to change at the last minute. When he was arrested, would Jesus cast aside the officers and take up his authority over them in Rome? When he was on trial, would he somehow at the last minute be found innocent? And released. As he went to the cross, would he not call down angels to come and rescue him? But now none of these things have happened. Jesus is on the way to the cross, indeed hanging on the cross. And his followers have to begin to understand the words that he spoke to them. He was indeed leaving them and nothing was going to change that. Friends, I think all of us here know the pain of somebody leaving them, leaving us. We know the pain and heartache of someone close to us who dies. We know the pain when a dear friend or a family member or a child immigrates or moves to a different city. A well-loved colleague who retires. 
The reality of this life is those whom we love leave us. And it's always difficult. Friends, we've been journeying through with a book written by Henry Nolan called Can You Drink the Cup? And as we've journeyed with that book over the last few weeks, we've, we've become aware of some of the stories of the people that he encountered in his life. We've heard stories of some of the residents that he discovers in his life and ministry at our daybreak. Today we hear the story about Gordy who has Down syndrome and he said this. He said, what is good about our life is that you make so many friends. What is bad about our life is that so many friends leave. And he was speaking about the many volunteers who, who helped out at the home, at the centre, people who had become dear to him and with whom he had formed close bonds. But sooner or later, these volunteers had to leave. Some of them were married, some of them lost their work permits, some discovered that life in that community wasn't for them. But Gordy stayed. And he felt the pain of separation again and again as, as new people came and he got to know them and no sooner had he got to know them when they left. One day the founder of Daybreak came for a visit and he was asked this question. And he replied gently. And he said, perhaps they feel sad when those who have come leave because you asked the question, if they really loved you, why would they leave? If they really loved you, why would they go again? And he went on to explain that the volunteers weren't just leaving daybreak, but also they were returning to their schools and to their homes and to their families and would take with them the love and joy they had experienced with the handicapped. And so the residents were able to see that was for them, a cup of sorrows became a cup of salvation for others. And perhaps we may feel that way for those who have left to make a better life for themselves elsewhere. But this is the deep truth that we struggle with and wrestle with, particularly today, but as we've been speaking about drinking the cup. Drinking the cup of sorrow and of joy is only possible when it brings us health and strength and freedom and hope and courage and new life. Nobody is willing to take the cup and drink it when it makes us sick and miserable. And so the coming and going of friends, the experiences of love and betrayal, of care and indifference, of generosity and stinginess, become for us the way to true human freedom. While it's sad for us, we can discover healing and wholeness in it. Jesus drank the cup of life. He experienced praise and adulation and admiration and immense popularity. The crowds gathered around him. The crowds had gathered around him on Palm Sunday, welcoming him into Jerusalem. He also experienced rejection, ridicule, and mass hatred. The same crowds who shouted Hosanna moments later cry out, crucify him. And Jesus took all of those different responses to his, to his life and his presence as one who had come to fulfill a mission and who kept his focus on that mission regardless of what the response of the crowd was. He knew that to accomplish his task, he had to drink the cup. And he knew that drinking it would bring freedom and glory and wholeness. He knew that drinking the cup would lead beyond the entrapment of this world to complete liberation. He knew that beyond the agony of death was the glory of resurrection. The disciples didn't. They simply struggled with the fact, as we struggle, that Jesus was leaving them and he didn't seem to be doing anything about it. Why was he allowing everybody else 
to control, apparently, his life and his death when he had the power to intervene. But the cup which Jesus drank, which he drank till it was empty, became the cup of salvation. And so drinking the cup of salvation means emptying the cup of sorrow and the cup of joy so that God can fill it with pure life. Drinking the cup of salvation means losing the false life so that we can discover the true one. And so Jesus going to the cross and drinking his cup is about salvation, not just his, but about his disciples and ours as well. The disciples are sad to see him leave. But this is where we find salvation. And what is it that we need to be saved from? Or we may say we need to be saved from sin and death. Sin, the brokenness of addictions, alcohol, drugs, food, gambling, sex, whatever it is. Compulsions, obsessions, consumerism. All entrapments that take away our freedom as children of God, they enslave us in a cramped and a shrunken world. And we try to make our lives according to our desires and wishes, ignoring the cup that is given to us. And so we become self-indulgent and self-centered, focused only on ourselves and what we want. The cross is the opposite of that. Drinking the cup that we have, even though it's oftentimes full of that which is unpleasant, is refusing to indulge ourselves by choosing the easy way. And we need to be saved from death, which entraps us. We're surrounded by death as we hear about death from illness, death from murder and attacks, death from car accidents and misfortune. And sooner or later, the inevitability of our own death will catch up with us. And so sin and death entrap us, and drinking the cup is the way out of that cup. Drinking the cup is the way to salvation. It's a hard and a painful way, a way that we often try to avoid at all costs because we don't like what our cup holds. But unless we are willing to drink our cup, real freedom will elude us. For Jesus, drinking his cup, was going to the cross. For his disciples, drinking the cup was the bitterness of Jesus leaving them. The bitterness of Good Friday. But to quote a well-known evangelist, it's Friday, but Sunday is a coming. And so when Jesus, having finished the cup, experiences the glory of resurrection. And when the disciples who have left feeling betrayed and let down by Jesus have drank, drunk in the cup, we discover a glorious resurrection. And we discover Jesus and his disciples being reunited in glorious forgiveness. And as we battle and struggle to drink the cup and eventually get to the bottom, we discover too the joy of resurrection and indeed salvation. No one finishes his chapter with these words. He says, salvation is not only a goal for the afterlife. Salvation is the reality of every day that we can taste here and now. When I sit down with Adam and help him eat, when I chat with Bill about our next trip, when I have coffee with Suzanne and breakfast with David, when I embrace Michael, kiss Patsy or pray with Gordy, salvation is right there. And when we sit together around the low altar table and I offer to all present the glass cup filled with wine, I can announce with great certainty this, this is the cup of salvation. And so I pray that as we struggle and wrestle with life together, as we have journeyed looking at our cups during this Easter, that as we look to the example of Jesus who goes to the cross and experiences resurrection life, that we too will have the courage to take the cup that is before us, to drink it to the full, to go to the cross with Jesus, 
and also with Jesus to experience the new life that we discover in resurrection. Pray that it would be so for you as for me. Amen. So friends, I invite you once again into a time of prayer, and once again there will be responses on the screen. God sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. Let us therefore pray to our Heavenly Father for people everywhere according to their need. For the Church of God throughout the world, for those preparing for baptism, and for all who suffer for the sake of Christ, that God will confirm His people in faith, strengthen them in love, and preserve them in peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Almighty and everlasting God, by your Spirit and the whole body of the Church, is governed and sanctified. Hear the prayers we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry each may serve you in holiness and truth, to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Amen. For the nations of the world and their leaders, for our own country and those who govern us, and for all who work for reconciliation, that by God's help we may live in justice, peace and freedom, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. God of peace, whose will is to restore all things, in your beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority, and bring the families of the nations divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin, to be subject to his just and gentle rule, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. For God's covenant people, Israel, whom he called to be his own, and for all who seek to live in the light of God's truth, that with them God will grant us grace to live in faithfulness and to grow in the love of his name, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Eternal God, bless all who look to Abraham as the father of faith. Set us free from prejudice, blindness and hardness of heart, that in accordance with your will and guided by your truth, our life together may be for the glory of your name. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For all those who lack faith, and for those who are hostile to it, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. God, our Redeemer, who called your church to witness that you were in Christ, reconciling the world to yourself. Help us to so proclaim the good news of your love that all who hear it may be reconciled to you. Through him who died for us and rose again and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For all who suffer, for victims of violence, injustice and abuse, for the lonely, the bereaved and those without hope, for the sick, the dying, and all who care for them, 
And in his mercy, God will sustain them with the knowledge of his presence. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, hear the prayers of your children who cry out to you in their need. In their afflictions, show them your mercy, and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Remembering those who have died, all whose lives have ended in loneliness, and all who have offered their lives for the sake of others, and remembering the saints and martyrs of every generation, that we also, inspired by their example, may have grace to glorify Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Have mercy. Almighty and ever everlasting God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, set his passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death, and bring us with the whole creation to the light and glory of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 